Uh, hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar and this is the fifth webinar of this webinar series conducted by WSO2 financial open banking team uh, prior to this webinar we had uh, four sessions in the first session actually we discussed uh, what is new in WSO2 uh, open banking latest release and in the second webinar we discussed on API security uh, third webinar was on uh, strong customer authentication and then uh, the fourth webinar we discussed about OBI direct integration and today's webinar is on uh, PISP journey which is also based on open banking UK specification and I will consider UK spec question 3 as the base for this discussion uh, wherever period I will highlight the key changes in the version 3.1 or as well my name is Charit Deshapre and I am a senior software engineer in WSO2 Financial Open Banking team. So today's uh, webinar will be available on demand after the live session and we will be sending the accessible links after the session. Uh, if you have any question, please feel free to send it to us. And uh, I'll be sharing our email address at the end of this session and we'll be sure uh, to follow up them later on. So this is the uh, agenda of today's program. Uh, first, I'll be giving you a brief introduction to PISP and what are the opportunities unlocked by PISP, PISP in revised PSD2 directive. Uh, next, we'll be discussing about the different payment types in UK spec version 3 and the related API resources. Next, I will walk you through the PISP flow and explain the full life cycle of a payment. Then we will discuss about multi-authorization payments, cut-off date time validations, and other payment restrictions, and some important validations supported by WSO2 Open Banking Solution. Next, I will explain how to integrate WSO2 Open Banking Solution with the bank backend for the payment services. Uh, finally, we will discuss about the release management. Uh, that is how payment resources are allowed to access across different API versions and at the end of the presentation I'll be doing small demonstration on how a payment APIs are functioning in WSO2 open banking solution so that uh, you may understand how these flows are implemented in our solution. The open banking API specification support payment initiation services that enables a PASP to or, or, or a payment in institution service provider to initiate payment order with the payment service user's explicit consent. This means PISPs are able to withdraw money directly from the customer account provided she has given his consent to the SPSP to allow PISP to do so. If the customer has more than one account, he can choose which account the money will be deducted from. It is important to note that PISP is a regulated actor under PSD2, which provides payment services for the end user. What is improved by what, is, what, what are the payment services uh, improvements that we can see in PSD2? If you look at this picture, it shows how actually PSD2 has improved the payment user experience compared to the traditional uh, card-based card payments that we are already familiar with. If you can see here, the traditional card scheme-based payment flow is shown by the dotted lines. In this flow, the customer provides their card details to the payment input page. The payment request then goes to the merchant's acquiring bank and then to the relevant card scheme for the authorization. A typical example would be a payment that we do via Visa or MasterCard. Once the validation is successful, a request for the payment is sent to the customer's card issuing bank where verification is done and the payment is issued. As opposed, opposed to that, 
PSD2 introduces a new payment flow that has fewer steps in the value chain. It allows merchants to accept payments directly from the consumer's issuing bank account. The solid lines here shows the PSD2 payment flow. In this flow, the merchant will directly communicate with the payment initiation service provider who will contact the issuing bank. In the UK specification version 3, we have uh, seven different payment order types. Those are domestic payments, domestic scheduled payments, domestic standing orders, international payments, international scheduled payments, international standing orders, and file payments. With reference to the business flow, the first six types actually follow the same flow. And in the file payments, there are some differences and we'll be discussing them in the upcoming section of this presentation. The first payment type is domestic payments. These are the payments where the fund transfers happening between two accounts in the same country. In order to initiate uh, uh, domestic payment, PISPs must either uh, allow PSUs to specify below minimum set of uh, parameters or pre-populate them for the PSUs. Those parameters are payment amount and the currency, payment account name, pay account identification details like account number, sort code or, or IBAN. And uh, this account selection can be done in the PISP domain or in ASPSP domain. Uh, PISP domain means if the TPP already knows the debit account, you can send the account information in the payment initiation request. And the PSU will only have to authorize in the authorization flow. The SPSP domain means PSU will be allowed to select an account out of his payable accounts uh, that is obtained from the bank in the authentication flow. And this, in this scenario, uh, PISP doesn't know about the custom accounts when you initiate the payments. That's why we allow uh, payment services user or PSU to choose those accounts in the authentication flow. So there are a couple of uh, different payment schemes which are applicable to domestic payments, such as single immediate payments. Uh, via faster payments, which is actually the default case. Then we have BAX payments. BAX is an electronic system used to make payments directly from one bank to another. The, the service is operated and managed by BAX Payment Schemes Limited, and a payment can take up to uh, two, three days to clear. And then we have CHAPS payment. It is also a British payment system, which offers same different transfers. The scheduled payment is an instruction on behalf of a PSU to his ASPSP to make a one-off payment for a specific amount to a specific pay on a specific future date. Since these are domestic, the fund transfer happens between two accounts in the same country. The same parameters that we discussed in the earlier case uh, have to be populated by the TPP in case of domestic uh, scheduled payments as well. So here also we can uh, uh, do the account selection in the PISP domain or in the ASPSP domain. Then we have domestic standing orders. A standing order is a periodic payment or an instruction to a bank by an account holder to make regular fixed payment to a particular person or an organization. Here, PISP can instruct on behalf of the PSU to say SPSP to make a series of payment of a specific amount to a specific pay on a number of specified future dates or on a regular basis. So here, uh, in addition to the parameters that we specified for the domestic payments and domestic scheduled payments, 
we have to specify a schedule for this. A schedule may contain a frequency, or that is the interval between two periodic payments, and number of payments, that is the number of payments that we will be uh, making in completing this frequency sequence, and the first payment date and time, and recurring payment date and time. The recurring, recurring payment date and time means the specific, uh, this, this has to be specified if the recurring payment date is different from the first payment date. And then we have final payment date time, that is the date on which the final payment is scheduled. So, uh, we have international payments similar to domestic payments. We, are, we have three, three, three types of international payments as well. Those are international payments, international schedule payments, and international standing orders. So idea is same, but the, the difference is uh, the, 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 the payment is made between two accounts in two different countries. So in order to uh, initiate such a payment, uh, PSP has to additionally populate uh, certain details. Uh, so when we, when the payment initiation request is made, sent, uh, it has to specify the currency because it is important because it is an international payment and destination currency, destination country, uh, instruction priority, whether it is a normal or a urgent payment, pay account name, and the pay account identification details. So here also we can uh, uh, select the account in uh, PISP domain or in the ASPSP domain. So international schedules payments are also similar to uh, domestic schedule payments. The only difference is uh, we need to uh, populate the schedule here. Uh, and the currency transfer happens between uh, two different countries. Standing orders are also same. Uh, you also PSU can set up uh, an instruction to the SPSP to make series of payment. And uh, uh, the transaction is uh, international transaction where the one transfer happen, happens between accounts in two different countries. The file payments actually allow multiple payments to be done in a single instruction. The transaction details are received to the SPSP in the form of a file. And there are basically uh, two, types, type, two types of payments that we can identify here. The first one is bulk payments. The bulk payment is a group of payments to be paid to multiple credit accounts from the same debit account on the same day. And uh, then we have batch payments. That is a group of payments uh, to be paid to multiple credit accounts from multiple debit accounts. The difference is in the batch payments, we can uh, have instru instructions to pay from multiple debit account to multiple credit accounts. And also, this may involve different payment execution dates, currencies, and payment schemes. So in the file payment uh, flow, we can identify certain differences. The key difference is the consent staging process in file payment is broken down into two steps. So in, in all other cases, the consent staging is a single uh, API call, but uh, here in file payments, we have two endpoints uh, that is used for consent staging. So in the in the first step, ASPSP will receive some metadata about the file, and in the second step, the ASPSP will receive the actual file. So then only the TPP is able to run PSU through the authentication flow. And uh, I will explain this further in the uh, upcoming slides where I'm uh, discussing about the uh, uh, flow. Uh, 
Okay, uh, then uh, regarding the payment API resources, so all the all the payments uh, have uh, payment order consent resource, payment and the payment order resource. And for these two resources, we have two different endpoints. One is for creating the resource, and the the other one is for the uh, retrieving the resource. And in the file payments, there are some additional resources uh, because, uh, as I said earlier, we uh, there are some differences in the consent staging process. So, uh, because of that, uh, uh, except to the first uh, post instruction to where we that we use for the consent staging, we have another post uh, request to upload the file. And also, uh, if the TPP wants, he can download the file using this get file payment consent, consent ID slash file endpoint. And also, after making the payment, uh, there is a capability to get a report from the bank regarding the payment. So that we use this third get method. Uh, So in, in UK spec version 3.1.0, so there are, uh, in addition to these APIs, we have funds confirmation endpoint uh, that is used to check uh, if the data account has enough funds to make this payment during the uh, payment flow. Okay, oh, this is uh, the high level uh, uh, picture of the PISP flow. Uh, so here we can actually uh, see four steps involved for this process. So we have the PSU, that is the customer. And then we have the PISP, the payment initial service provider and the bank. So in the first step, uh, the PSU requests a payment initiation from the PISP and the PISP then it communicates to the bank and after that the PSU has to uh, connect with the bank and uh, provide his consent to proceed on with this payment and then the bank can execute the payment order. So let, let's uh, discuss this in, in detail in the next slide. Okay, uh, so in order to uh, start, a, start a payment, first PSU uh, has to agree on the payment order initiation. And then uh, uh, the PISP will uh, send the payment consent to the SPSP. So all these uh, communication between PISP and the SPSP happens uh, across such a uh, channel that is mutually authenticated. And in the first step, uh, uh, TPP, uh, TPP has to uh, retrieve an access token providing his client credentials. And using that access token, he can actually post the payment order consent to the SPSP. So at this point, uh, we will, uh, in the solution, we, we, we mark the consent states as awaiting authorization. And we will reply to the PISP with the consent ID. Now, uh, this, this case is uh, related to the file payments. As I told you earlier, uh, the file payment consent staging is broken down into two steps. The step 2A, is this is the setup file payment order consent. And uh, this, this uh, request will carry only some metadata about the file to be updated, uploaded in the next step. So this metadata includes a file type and a file hash. A file hash is basically a base64 encoding of a SHA-256 hash of the file to be uploaded. And apart from those information, 
uh, the PISP can also send the number of transactions, the, the control sum, or, or the total value of the payments, requested ex execution date, and the data account as well. And this data account is applicable only for the bulk payments. Now, uh, when we receive the consent uh, metadata to the uh, SPSP, we will mark the consent status as awaiting upload. Now, in the previous case, we directly uh, mark it as awaiting authorization, but uh, here we'll uh, mark it as awaiting upload until the file is uploaded in the next step. So, in the step 2B, the actual file upload happens, and when that happens, we will actually uh, compare the file with the metadata that we received in the first step, and if it uh, if that validation passes, we'll mark the consent as uh, awaiting authorization and uh, send the successful response back to the PISP. So now in the next step, the PISP uh, has to run the PSU through the uh, authentication flow. So for this, uh, actually, uh, the specs is about uh, two approaches. One is uh, redirect flow, and the other one is the uh, decouple flow. But in the uh, WSO2 financial open banking solution, we support only redirection flow. So in the redirection flow, what happens is uh, the redirect, uh, the, the, the PSU is directed to the SPSP authentication uh, uh, endpoint and he has to provide his uh, credentials and uh, uh, authenticate and if, if SCA is enabled he has to uh, provide the SCA information as well and then uh, in the, he will get a consent page where he can see the initial details about the payment to be made and then uh, he can uh, uh, choose an account as well and then he can authorize the consent and once he authorized the consent the consent status at the SPSP will become authorized so after authorization uh, the PISP will get a authorization code and he has to exchange that with the SPSP authorization server for an access token. And in the next step, using that access token, he can uh, send the actual payment submission to the SPSP. So after uh, uh, receiving the actual payment, uh, there, there are certain validations going on the SPSP site uh, to ensure the, the TPP has uh, submitted the correct payment resource and if it is successful uh, we'll send it to the uh, banking backend and uh, the received response will be direct uh, sent back to the PISP so uh, after pay, uh, uh, in the in the uh, after doing a payment initiation or payment submission, uh, the, those two resources can be retrieved using those uh, get payment order, payment uh, order consent endpoints. This is what I actually have shown in this picture. Okay, uh, so, so think about a scenario where you want to do a multi, uh, do a payment from a joint account. Then obviously, all the users of the account has to authorize the payment. So this is where multi-authorization comes to play, and this functionality can be used by the SPSPs to facilitate any payment initiation request which requires authorization of uh, multiple parties. 
Through PISP, PSU will initiate the payment and then multiple PSUs will consume the same authorization flow in order to grant required permission to the uh, uh, to process the payment. So in WSO2 solution, uh, we support uh, multi-authorization for all the payment types except uh, file payments. So this is uh, uh, actually an example uh, use case of a multi-authorization payment where two users of a joint account are engaging in authorizing the payment. In the first step, PISP will send the usual consent and here PISP may request an authorization type for the payment order as single or any. If a value is not provided, an SP, SP will consider the authorization type as any. Therefore, by default, multi-authorization is enabled. Then the first user or the PSUA will run through the authorization flow and during this and during this flow the solution will identify the, if the selected account is a joint account and after that multiple multi-authorization flow will be initiated. Uh, in the next step the PSP will exchange the received authorization code with an access token and submits the payment. At this point, solution marks the consent uh, as consumed, but the multi-authorization step will be set as awaiting further authorization. The multi-authorization, uh, uh, sorry, the, the core banking backend can call multiple authorization API in the WS2 open backing solution and check if the payment has been authorized by all the users before proceeding on the on with the payment. Now you can see uh, when the uh, second user, the PSUB, authorized the payment, only this multi authorization status will become authorized. So the bank can ping to the solution and check if. Uh, check whether all the users have authorized this particular payment before the bank proceeds on with the payment. So these are the uh, uh, API resources uh, in the in the multi-authorization API. So first we have a uh, 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 endpoint consent ID slash status, and this returns multiple authorization status for a particular consent ID. Actually, this can be used to pull the status of an ongoing multiple authorization by the cone backing system. And uh, the, for the, the, the second endpoint is used to get multiple uh, authorization users for a particular consent ID. And this allows to see users status of the multiple authorization session. So uh, similar to that, there are there's another get uh, endpoint. Uh, the third one the re that returns multiple authorization for consent ID. And uh, in order to initiate a multiple authorization session, the post consent post method, the fourth method will be used. And uh, if in, in order to uh, update the use authorization uh, status of a consent, the fifth method, the put method, can be used. Okay. Uh, next, we'll be we'll discuss about some of the key validations uh, mandated in the uh, specification. The first one is uh, idem potency key validation. So this validation is there to allow TPP to retry the same resource uh, within an interval of 24 hours. X idem potency key requested is used to achieve this purpose. For payment initiation request, WSO2 OP solution stores the idem potency key with the payment initiation resource and carries out the idem potency key validation for every payment initiation request. 
In the same way, uh, the appears to be a solution performed the interpreters key validation for the uh, payment files. That is, uh, when you are uploading a file, the same file can be uploaded uh, multiple times within uh, 24 hours under one and a uh, single idempotency. However, uh, for the payment submission request, bank backend has to carry out this validation uh, by keeping a mapping between the consent ID and the idempotency key for the submitted payments. So then uh, we have uh, JWS signature validation. Uh, in the in the in the uh, in one of our previous webinars on API security, we discussed uh, more details about this. Uh, so the payment initiation API in the UK Open Banking has mandated that from version uh, three and above, all inbound requests must be digitally signed by the API consumer, and all the responses must be signed by the API provider. So ultimately, this is to meet a non-reputation requirement whereby both parties can assure themselves that the request and the response originated by the private key holder and no message tampering has occurred somewhere in the connection. Further details, uh, I, if you want further details, please go through the API secret webinar. Uh, we discuss more, more details about how we create these signatures, uh, etc. And uh, this uh, validation and response signing is done by your handler that is engaged to the API manager gateway. Then we have cutoff date time validation. So, cutoff date time is the time limit of a day established by your bank for receiving of payments. An SPSP may update the payment order consent or the payment order resource with the cutoff date time or execution or expected execution date time and the ex expected settlement date time to, to communicate expected execution behavior if the cutoff time has elapsed. So according to the spec, the bank can follow two strategies to handle a payment if it is made after cutoff time has elapsed. Uh, the first option is he can reject the payment. Uh, and the second case is the SPSP can accept the payment. In this case, uh, it has to communicate the expected execution time and the expected settlement time of the following day to the TPP. So, so we have uh, certain payment restrictions in the solution. So if uh, uh, even though the spec does not impose any restriction, the, the, the ASPs can determine appropriate restrictions based on their uh, functionality. So for example, in WS Open, Open Bank Solution, we have maximum instructed amount allowable uh, for the payments. That is uh, the, the maximum number of uh, amount that can be uh, included in a payment. And then we have the domestic standing order frequency pattern. So when I discussed about the standing orders, uh, I, just, I, I, I I highlighted about the frequency and in uh, uh, domestic payment standing orders, this uh, frequency is uh, specified in in the form of a regex pattern. And this regex pattern is configurable in uh, uh, WC2 Open Banking Solution and we will uh, validate all the domestic standing order request against this uh, regex pattern in order to ensure that the uh, request is uh, received successfully. Then we have uh, a maximum future date for scheduled payments. Uh, 
So in case of in case of payment order consent violates any of these restrictions, ASP will be will reject the request and send the proper uh, error details to the TPP. And these payment restrictions uh, are configured in the open back in XML file. Uh, if you go through it, you can see uh, under the payment restrictions, there are maximum instructed amount, uh, maximum future payment date, and then uh, the cutoff date time validation parameters. And if uh, in the default, uh, we will uh, 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 cut off date time policy we will uh, uh, keep back reject but if it is uh, uh, changed to accept state then we have to specify this daily cut off time expected execution date time and expected settlement time parameters as well okay uh, the the next topic is uh, on how the bank Backend integration can be done with open packet solution. So this is a high level picture of how each component of WSO to OBS solution is interconnected. So we discussed uh, more details about these deployments in our first webinar. And here I will focus only on integrating back backend services to support payment flows. I was looking at the diagram from the bottom. Uh, the PSPs will already have services and APIs from the uh, previous do era. So this may be legacy systems, and the APIs may not have been designed to expose to the public, and the data formats may not be very API friendly. So while uh, WSO to API manager has the capability to perform mediation on these services and APIs to expose them in the desired manner. It is recommended to have a separate WSO2 enterprise service bus to do the heavy lifting of mediation. This is logically a clear separation and would have positive effect on both mediation functionality as well as WSO2 API manager performance. So mainly a following APIs of the core banking system uh, has to be connected to the WSO2 open banking solution in order to support the PSP flow. So uh, the first two uh, payments, the pay, uh, endpoints APIs, the payment submission API and the payment retrieval API is coming from OB uh, standard. And then we have payable accounts API. Actually, we are using that uh, 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 API to get the payable account of the user during authentication flow. If the TPP has not provided any data account in the payment initiation request, PSU is able to select one of those accounts when the when he provides the consent to the payment. If the TPP has sent the data account in the initiation request, this API is used to validate the provided account against the actual payable accounts under his name. So when we when we call this payable accounts API, uh, we have to send the consent ID and the user ID as query parameters to the core bank backend. So when we interconnect uh, 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 with the core banking backend, and we and, when, and call in this, those APIs, sometimes we use custom headers. So, okay, before that, uh, actually, I will explain this as well. So, this backend integration configuration uh, is available in two places. Uh, one is uh, payment dynamic endpoint in sequence. And this, this in sequence will contain the base URL for the uh, core banking backend. And uh, 
then uh, the payable account retrieve endpoint is configured in the open banking XML file. So now back to the uh, custom headers. Uh, so as I said, when you communicate uh, with the core banking backend, we have to use certain uh, custom headers and payloads uh, to communicate certain information to the banking backend. Uh, for in, in the, the first use case is uh, uh, account ID. So uh, when we uh, submit the payment to the core banking backend, the, the bank has to know the uh, uh, account from which the uh, fund is going to be deducted from. For that, uh, we use account ID header. And this account ID header contains the uh, authorized uh, data account of the payment service user. And this uh, account ID header is sent as a base 64 in cut history. And this is set all set in all the payment types except uh, batch payments. And then in the in the file uh, payment uh, scenario, we have to send the file to the core banking backend. So for that, uh, we actually uh, uh, send the file in the payment submission payload as a base 64 encoded string. And uh, the bank can re uh, use this, uh, decode this payment file and proceed on with uh, multiple uh, payments included in that. So the next topic is release management. The release management points out uh, the imposed restrictions for accessing APIs across different specific spe specification versions. So uh, if we consider about the payment uh, order consent resource, PSPs are not allowed to create payment order consent in one version and uh, Submit the perm, uh, submit the actual payment in a different version. At the same time, PSPs are not allowed to access payment order consent created in a newer version via a uh, previous version endpoint. Then ASP has the option to allow PISP or not to access consent created in an older version via a new version endpoint. But in our solution. Uh, we allow this. So if we consider about the uh, payment order resource, the PISPs are not allowed to use the consent from previous version to create a payment order in the new version and vice versa. The PISP is not allowed to access payment order resource created in a new version via a previous endpoint. But PISPs are allowed to access the payment order resource created in a previous version on a newer version in part. And these uh, release management configurations are available in open banking uh, XML file, which basically says uh, if a resource is uh, accessed across version, a resource created in, a, in an older version can be accessed only by a newer version and the other ways is uh, actually not allowed. So this is uh, actually pretty much uh, all I wanted to cover regarding uh, payments. So if you want more information, uh, you can go through these additional resources. And uh, if you have any questions or, or concerns, you can get in touch with us. Uh, uh, using our open banking demo at wsotor.com. And uh, if you want to see uh, the, the solution roadmap, you can use this link. Uh, then the, uh, the, the, art, the two links in the bottom of the slides are some articles. Uh, if you're interested, you can go through them and uh, uh, read to get more information. 
and uh, thanks uh, and uh, in the next uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, do some demo uh, so that you can uh, understand how uh, WSO2 open banking solution uh, provides uh, support for this uh, ASP flaws so uh, in the, the first example uh, I'm going to uh, uh, do a domestic payment uh, uh, where the account selection happens at the ASPSP. So uh, ideally, uh, there will not there will not be any uh, uh, data account in the initiation. The payment service user when he logs into the uh, consent web app uh, or the authentication web app. He has the option to choose from his payable accounts in this case. So, so before uh, uh, in order to access domestic domestic payment consent uh, resource, uh, we need to get uh, an access token. For that, we have to use find credential account type. So now. Uh, uh, I'm going to send a request. So here, uh, okay, we have to send the client assertion. And we send the request to reply with the access token. And we can use this access token to uh, initiate the uh, payment. Okay, now uh, uh, here is the payload of the payment initiation request. As you can see, there is no any uh, uh, data account specified here. And when you send the request, it will reply uh, with a consent ID. And uh, then uh, we have to authorize this payment. So uh, in order to authorize this payment, we have to uh, send a request to the Authentication endpoint. And uh, we are going to send the request object. <coughs> okay. uh, now So okay, now the PSC has to log into the uh, authentication web back, with that and provide his consent. So now uh, we have configured PSC as a user. Okay, now when he logs into the uh, consent page, he will be shown all the details regarding uh, uh, this particular payment, and then. He has the option to select from his payable accounts. And now uh, you can select one of those accounts and approve the consent. And when he approves it, uh, 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 authorization code will be received. And now, uh, in actual case, this will be uh, sent to a callback. Uh, that is registered by the TPP, but in this case, I have provided a, a, a sample, an example uh, callback, which is a local host slash callback. Now uh, we will take this authorization code, and then we have to exchange uh, it to access token.
okay now we got the access token using that actual token we can actually uh, submit the actual pen So here we need to ensure that we send the same uh, payload that we send, uh, send, that, send in the initiation request. And uh, we have to additionally send this consent ID as well. So let it, let's get it from here. Okay, something went wrong. Let, let me check. I think I didn't give the consent ID proper. Okay, now it's so, so when you submit the payment we will receive the we will receive the uh, response from the uh, band back backend now in this case we are actually uh, uh, using the mock backend provided in the WSO2 open backend solution okay, now the second example uh, that I'm going to try out is uh, uh, domestic scheduled payment where the account selection will happen uh, at the PISP that is uh, in the payment initiation request we are going to send the data account so that the user will not be allowed to select any other account uh, only thing he has he can do is approving or the denying the uh, consent uh, so we have to first uh, get the uh, token using the client credentials And uh, when we get the access token, we, have, uh, we need to set the scope that I actually uh, forgot to mention. We have to set the scope as payments and open ID. And the scope for the received token is also uh, open ID and payments. And using this token, uh, we will initiate the uh, domestic schedule payment. So if you look at the uh, uh, body of the or the payload of the scheduled payment, you can see there's a debit account. And uh, in the previous case, we didn't send this. But in, the, in this case, we are going to send data account. And uh, uh, I'm going to show you that the, uh, this account is shown locked in the consent page uh, so that the user is not allowed to uh, change this during the authorization flow. Okay, we'll send this and we'll get a consent ID. So now we have to uh, run the PSU through the authentication flow.
now you can see the the account selection is not allowed here so we have already selected the account the user can only approve or this uh, deny this uh, concern so when we have this we will get the authorization code and this authorization code can be shared and uh, exchanged for an access token So that's what you call that. Okay, now we got the access token and using this we can actually uh, submit the payment to send the uh, consent ID in the payment body. Okay. Now uh, we'll get the response in the map packet. Uh, after successful submission of the plan. Okay, guys, the, this is actually what I wanted to demonstrate. So, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to send it to us and we'll follow up them. And thank you very much for participating in this program. And uh, we wish to see you again with a new webinar in the future. Thank you very much.